everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Hi, I'm Linda Orsoletto. I am the president of Lock Forest City Club this year. Welcome, and it's great to see this full room. A lot of familiar faces, but some that are new too. So again, thank you so much for coming. City Club would not survive without our sponsors and members like you. So welcome to our friends, elected officials, members, and I'm gonna start out and please be patient because it's a long list of sponsors, so thank you, but we're always looking for more sponsors, but I just want to recognize people here today. So our sponsors are ASI Wealth Management, the City of Bend, Central Oregon Community College, OSU Cascades, you can shout out if you want, <laughs> St. Charles, Pacific Source, Central Oregon Association of Realtors, Brooks Resources, and our newest silver sponsor, Payne West. So, yes, yes. And thank you also to today's sponsors, Mid-Oregon Credit Union and Steel and Associates. And as I mentioned, City Club um, is supported a lot by members, so I would like to ask everybody who is new to City Club since January to please stand. Come on. No, you're shy? Thank you, thank you for joining. So a little bit about today. This is the Regional City Managers Forum, which is always extremely popular, usually fills the house. So we are going to have moderated discussion. So really all you need to do is just raise your hand and somebody is going to come to you and then you can speak. And please, when you are um, asking your question, please keep it, it, it very brief. And then just remember, we are here to have some civil dialogue, which I know everybody here is going to follow. So again, today's moderator is Tammy Bainey, who moderated last year. Yes, a little bit about Tammy. She is, she is the executive director of Central Oregon Inter Intergovernmental Council. I bet you have to say that a lot. She, has, she is the former Deschutes County Commissioner past chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission and has served on the Oregon Housing Stability Council and has led the Central Oregon Health Council. And that's just a little bit of what she's done. So without further ado, here is Tammy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hello friends. Wonderful to see everyone. This is a fun event. Um, and I, it always just sort of blows my mind a little bit that everyone wants to come and talk over lunch about local government. And so it's not, I mean, it's not one of the sexiest topics, but it does impact your lives, so it's good that you're here. Uh, I want to start off by just saying thank you to City Club because this is a great opportunity for us to learn what's happening in our region. And I want to also shout out to the folks that are going to come up here and give you a little bit of insight into their communities. Um, a recent study uh, and survey conducted by the Oregon Values and Belief Center uh, received nearly 3,000 comments from our region's residents about what they see as the most critical issues facing their lives as Central Oregonians. And they had three big concerns on their minds. And I, I, I don't know that any of these are going to be a surprise, but the first one is their uh, personal finances, including housing. Next is drought and water supply. And next is homelessness. And so uh, they're worried about that for both their current daily lives and of course what's happening in the future. And it's no secret that Central Oregon, again, is the fastest growing region in the state of Oregon. This year though, we have a new chapter and that is the beautiful city of Prineville is the fastest growing city in our region. And so we're gonna be hearing a little bit about that. Yeah, big shout out to Prineville. I mean, yes, yes. So in the words of uh, Winston Churchill, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, and the optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And so our panelists today will share some opportunities, obstacles, and optimism, except for Keith from Redmond. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> 
I know that there's, yes, there's a cynic seat. So uh, for those of us that, uh, there is a bit of bantering. So if this is your first city club with the regional managers, uh, buckle up. So um, wanted to just, uh, okay, so, and uh, most importantly, how do they support and guide their councils through the pressures of growing communities? And so I'd like to welcome uh, to this area here, and they are, yes, in alphabetical order because there's a bit of competitive edge here. So I'd like to first welcome Bid City Manager Eric King. I'd like to next, Lapine City Manager Jeff Wilschlager. Madras Interim City Administrator Christy Worcester, who, shout out, today is her one month anniversary as the Interim City Manager in Madras, so I hope you all have really set a set of questions for Christy. And then next we have Prineville City Manager Steve Forrester, followed by Redmond City Manager Keith Witkowski, and then Sisters Interim City Manager Joe O'Neill. Do you want me to sing and then when I'm somebody, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll sing and then you pick a chair. Okay, all right. So moving right along like a herd of turtles. Uh, we are hoping to mix it up a little bit this year and so we're going to a little less moderator, a little more conversation. And so uh, we're hoping that amongst uh, the colleagues, you can tell there's a wee bit of banter. So hopefully they'll be able to sort of dive in with something that might be pertinent going on in their own community as the questions sort of roll. I do have a few prompts and the first one is that many of you may just assume that maybe city managers have a magic wand and they just magically guide their council to all the great things that they have uh, decided in their minds. Yes, I see Sally here, who I'm sure that's how it works. And so I uh, wanted to start off a little bit with level setting of what is the role of a, of a city manager or administrator and how does that, uh, I see Anthony here too, I'm sure that's how it works. Eric just tells you what's gonna happen, right? Okay, so I uh, wanted to, I know there are some slight differences among some of how the structures are, but Eric, if you wouldn't mind just kicking us off a little bit about the role of a city manager, administrator, and how you guide your council. Sure. Uh, uh, well, in the eyes of my, back then he was, what, five years old, I got a poster in my office, and he says, my dad, city manager, he goes to meetings and responds to emails. And that's pretty much what I do, what I do. I mean, if you want the real story, but I would describe my role, because I think people often are confused, wasn't the mayor running the city? Um, yes, there are cities that have strong mayor. Typically when you're over 250,000 in population, that's the predominant form of government. But most uh, small, and even, small, mid, and some large cities have a council manager form of government, where council sets policy, and there's variations of this, but city manager then runs the day-to-day -day operations. Going a little deeper than that, I, I look at my job in kind of four roles being the employee of the council, really taking that policy direction, making sure that I'm responsive to their concerns. I've served, I think, under about 30 or so council members over the last 16 years in Bend. So I think it's and very different, right? So I think really understanding how to work with a group or a board. I think a lot of us that maybe work for nonprofits, very similar. Uh, secondly, it's managing the day-to-day -day operations of the city, really being that face of the organization. Third, kind of that problem solver, when things kind of escalate uh, involving uh, our operations, how to, how to get in there and solve it. And then fourth is this regional, kind of working in a regional context with government, governmental agencies, private sector, et cetera. Excellent. So any other comments on how your councils function? Well, like, am I on? I'll just add to that in a little. Uh, in Madras, we have a slightly different charter, and the charter is the guiding document for the city. The charter in Madras is a city administrator form, and we so it's still council manager, but we have more of what is considered a weak uh, mayor system. So the mayor will actually be responsible for appointing the department heads uh, in our community. And uh, so that's where a difference lies as far as a city manager administrator in our city. Excellent. So now that we all have a good understanding of how things work, let's dive right into growth. 
And so I'm going to start with you, Steve. And uh, let's start off. You've been with Crook in Crook County for many, many years and serving as city manager for around since 2009 or so. And so a lot of change in the community of Crook as well as Prineville specifically. So when I say the word growth, what do you think of and kind of what impacts maybe in those opportunities or obstacles come to mind? Well, Prineville, uh, as a lot, a lot of you know, is a, a little bit different uh, culturally than, than some of our contemporaries here in the Central Oregon region in that we were heavily dependent on the forest products industry, a lot of blue collar jobs. And as the situation changed with how we manage uh, the national forests and the availability of timber, just like with many other cities like ours on the east side of the Cascades, uh, that industry shrank dramatically, as we all know. And so if you recall back during the Great Recession, we were about 22% unemployment. Our county had lost about 1,500 residents. And one of the things that the silver lining of being in that situation and coming out of the forest products industry that I did and bringing that business uh, background to bear was uh, long-term planning and looking out over the horizon, so to speak, on what we could do and how we would manage uh, our future with family wage jobs, infrastructure to support growth, uh, traffic issues, land issues, all those type of things. So we really took a step back during the, the horrible times that we were in in terms of where Prineville stood as an employer uh, for family wage jobs. And you know we had a very fortunate thing happen with the data center community. And what I'd like to share with everybody is we really focused on what we needed to do to promote growth. And, and we really started with infrastructure. And a good example of that would be the importance of relationships. Relationships with Brooks Resources, with Mr. Holleran and his team. Well, relationships with St. Charles as they looked at Prineville for a potential new hospital. An example would be is the city infrastructure was not on that site. And we partnered with uh, with Mr. Shelk and his, his uh, management team with the school district for their future plans with St. Charles, obviously, and we actually were able to upsize city infrastructure into that location. And all along the way between where it was um, inadequate, clear to the edge of that site on the, you know, to and through, I think everybody understands what that means. So that's what growth meant to us, is to take uh, a very proactive approach at building out the basic infrastructure needs ahead of time as much as we could possibly do, as much as was practical. And that served us very well. Shortly thereafter, we were able to land the data center community. Um, and obviously, we're up to $7 billion of investment in Crook County as a result of that happening. What's more important is because we had the infrastructure behind us and had a head start on that, we were able to leverage our relationships with those big companies to do things like aquifer storage and recharge. Uh, we finished up the wetland project, which is an environmentally friendly way to handle our wastewater. We did some traffic improvements, uh, built a new PD station, all as a result of that relationship. And we continue to have that in our back pocket right now as one of the most important things we can do. So that's what growth means to us, is to try to prepare our community for those investments with those investments come family wage jobs. And one of the mandates from our council in Prineville is we want to have the highest number of family wage jobs per capita of anybody in, in Oregon. And, it's, and I don't know where we're at. I don't really care other than we've got a lot of them. And we want to continue to do that. And so that's, that's what growth means to us is to try to look over the horizon, a lot of long-term planning, a lot of long-term modeling. If you look at our budget, that's a big part of it. So I hope that answers the question. Really well. And another round of applause for Prineville because, I mean. I'd, I'd like, uh, Tammy, I'd like to add something. Yeah. Um, a little history uh, that you might be interested in. I hope you are. Um, I was an Ochoco Lumber Scholarship kid, and I'm picking on Mr. Shelk and Mrs. Shelk. Um, and I came up, my dad was in Forest Products, uh, I was for a long time. And the beauty of the sawmills in Prineville, and if you remember, Prineville was one of the largest producers of ponderosa pine lumber in the world at one time with five or six operating sawmills for many, many decades. 
But it wasn't just the sawmills. It was the loggers, it was the people in the woods, it was the truck drivers, it was the railroad, it was the machinists, the welders, the electricians, the millwrights, the little business in town that su supported all that. And it occurred to me as we were developing our relationships with the data centers that that phenomenon may in fact repeat itself with the data center industry. And guess what folks, it has. And what's really interesting, a lot of those same fabricators, welders, machinists that used to serve the, and still serve the reman industry, we still have some forced products in our community, but now they've switched gears and they're building guards and steps and covers and different things for these large buildings. Uh, our uh, Proline bumper would be a great example. A lot of their powder coating and fabrication is now centered around the uh, data centers. We've got eight um, Rosen Electric that has about 450 employees that cited there to support the data centers. Ulf Electric as a distributor of electrical supplies. Um, many, many other small, mom, not mom pop, but medium range companies with benefited jobs that pay well um, are now supporting a new industry as well as some of the old, the old guard. So that phenomenon is really true and I think for all of Central Oregon, you know, if we can continue to diversify our economy, it's those mom pop jobs that go along with supporting those industries that really make a difference in our, our area here in Central Oregon. And I'll say it for you, I don't know that everyone in the community of Prineville was super excited when all of this got started. There was a bit of a you know, change and it was fearful of what does this mean? Is it gonna change the fabric of who we are, the uniqueness of what it means to be from Prineville and be in the community? And so great job navigating that and, and they give a lot back to the community as well in terms of community grants and support. They, they so yeah. um, wonderful to and just, see that. Just, I, I can't help myself, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Me and Steve um, show. No, it's good. Yeah, to to give you an idea how sensitive uh, the big data centers, I mean, for gosh sakes, folks, we got Apple and Facebook investing in, in Central Oregon. And uh, right now, currently, the site manager at Apple is a guy named Clay Allen. And the Allen family's been in Prineville about 150 years. Uh, Clay's a local boy and he's running the whole show. So a lot of people say, oh, they don't hire locally. About 75% of their workforce is from Central Oregon and a big percentage of the 75 is from Prineville. So that's what it means for us. Love All it. Us. Love the passion. And if we don't get to Keith and Redmond, he's going to leave. So, um, <laughs> it's like it's story time. Come on. It is story time. So next, let's go. And to I went no. <laughs> so growth. Go ahead. I mean, I think the question on growth has to do with your feelings, your therapy, meditation. <laughs> not a parole officer. Yeah. yeah well, right, right, Jim. You can never. You can't, you can't get away from them, Steve. The uh, so Redmond, right? We're at almost thirty-eight thousand people. When I started there 10 years ago, they were around like 25, so we've seen a lot of growth too. And um, it's, right, it's all the similar experiences that Ben has seen in their scale, Prineville has seen, and one of the biggest issues with growth where we're at right now, and even large cities deal with this, is how you deal with the word density. And, um, you know, I came from Portland a long time ago, and the D word was very bad in the 90s, in the early 2000s, right? And it's the same thing here, particularly when you live in a region that's so incredibly popular, and it kind of gets squeezed to death. And so what we've got when we look at growth is um, we've got a lot of transportation infrastructure that, that we need resources for on South Highway 97, on building overpasses. Um, these are hundreds of millions of dollars in costs, and we face the same thing that other cities face, which is there's not a plethora of transportation dollars flowing from state government. Um, obviously with housing, we're see there's a lot of uh, what used to be pastures, right, that is now um, housing. And so we, like everybody else in the area, has um, a housing crisis where our, I think the Beacon Report had Redmond at close to like four fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollars for median sales price. Bend is well above that. Um, Prineville, which is, yeah, and and the, the, I'm, I won't talk for for Jeff, but right, Lapine also is seeing um, massive growth in housing costs. So, how Redmond and how communities deal with that and make sure that you've got housing that employees of all variety can pay for, that you've got money for transportation. Um, it is a big deal, and um, you lay it with all the other issues we're going to talk about today, such as homelessness, um, and then just as the, the issues, let me back up. So I, with Redmond, when, when we talk to the community, right, everyone's like, let's try and keep the small town feel, which sounds great, but, you know, it's not entirely possible. So how as you grow, 
do you take advantages of growth, but then how do you have community conversations that maybe other generations weren't used to having? Like with Redmond on May 16th, we're going to talk about dispensaries, right? It's legal in the state, um, and it's not a conversation that the council has wanted to have in the past. So how do you kind of give grace and create room for people to have these kinds of conversations about dispensaries, about diversity, about homelessness, about all these issues, and to help um, meet the needs of residents that have just moved here in the last few years, but also, you know, understand the fears, right, of residents that lived here a long time. So, can I, you know, I'd like to just. Um, I feel like my mic is it kind of going in and out. Okay. <laughs> um, I think Redman, Redman, and Ben. I know. I think Prime, We all are dealing with this, you know, struggle with growth and people's reaction to it and density versus sprawl. I think what we've really tried to brand is the concept of complete communities where you have walkable neighborhoods, you can get out, you can get some of your local or daily needs met right in your neighborhood. Um, I know you have the great, is it great neighborhoods is kind of what you've branded in Redmond. And I think we have examples here of how we're trying to manage growth in different ways, more, you know, ways that don't replicate what people think about when they think of just big cities or in rural areas and kind of really calibrate to our community character. Um, but I'd love to hear maybe other cities and how they're reacting to that conflict and if you're finding kind of a middle ground in the form, the urban form of, of how you're growing. I'd like to jump in on that. So uh, not everybody may be familiar because often people don't drive to Lapine unless they're going somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> we weren't uh, scheduled to hit 3,000 people in our, our population within the city limits until 2030. We hit 2838 last summer. Um, and that's just within the city limits. This does require a little bit of a backstory. Lapine has only been incorporated for about 16 years at this point. So when people think of Lapine, especially when you speak to somebody who's from there, it's, it's a much broader conversation or a much broader geographical area. Uh, with the unincorporated population, we have about 14,000 people in, in what we consider the greater Lapine area. Um, so the voices that you hear within the city in many ways are a smaller contingent in the conversation not only because they're, they're obviously a smaller part of the, the overall population of the area, but a lot of the people in the city are new. And so a lot of this conversation about growth and where we're going is driven by unincorporated peoples, um, which creates a really creative or interesting uh, circumstance and demands creative solutions. Um, so on its face, um, I, I gave you the numbers of how quick we've grown within the city limits, but just to sort of double down on that, you know, when you think of the last time you were in Lapine, consider for the fact that in the last three years we've had over 300 new houses in the city limits built. I mean, that's enormous for a community of our size. And how we're addressing that, uh, where, where you can measure it, where the rubber meets the road, um, not only do we want to service those homes and, and the businesses that may come along and be associated with people moving to the area, uh, but we have over 300 acres of remaining residential zoned land in the city and over 130 acres of industrial land in the city shovel ready. And I'm not doing that to sell anything to you here. <laughs> I'm just letting you know we have this resource that people are, people are coming and they're buying it and they're building it. And so we've addressed that in sort of the scope of what are we gonna do to prepare ourselves for the next 10, 15 years, primarily by undertaking a $35 million water and sewer expansion project, which again, for a community of our size is enormous. Um, for a staff of my size is enormous. Uh, and that shall, uh, should wrap up in about seven or eight months, and that in a, in a quickly measurable amount is going to deliver water and sewer uh, to people within the city limits, 300 homes that previously were without. And it's also going to allow that remaining 300 acres of residential and 100 plus of industrial to be connected so we can increase our flow rates. Uh, we're also working with ODOT on, on several projects to prepare for the future. For those of you that have driven through in the last few years, you may have seen the bridge to nowhere, and there it still sits. Uh, <clears throat> that, is, that is under a measurement period by ODOT that by next summer they're going to know whether or not that project can go forward. But the intention is to, obviously from a transportation standpoint, bring better services to South County. Um, we're the only crossing over the rail line on 97 that remains between California and Washington, and they certainly want to address that. Um, we've also worked on some, some connectivity and transportation projects to make the city more livable. But all this is really in preparation for the larger conversation, going back to my comments about our rural population, that we are expanding on an effort right now, driven by the city and community partners, also from Sun River in the area, to bring those voices into the conversation and to create a bigger platform for the residents that, whether we directly or indirectly serve, we serve, and people that call will opine their hub or their home. And that also extends to Northern Klamath County. 
and Western Lake County. Um, so it's really important and we've recognized and we're now folding it in with support from my council to bring those, those voices and those, those conversations to the table so that we can make sure that we're planning in a way, not just contextually, but actually physically, that's going to represent the wants and the needs of, of South County in general. And Jeff, I want to underscore um, the fact, oftentimes people feel that local government is doing something to them and that they're actually not part of it. And so hats off to you for knowing that you needed to pull your community together to really do that placemaking conversation with your region, if you will, and decide how are we going to move forward together. And so with 300 homes, all of the infrastructure projects, that project going on, how many staff do you actually have? Currently I have eight and that includes four public works employees. So that was eight? Yeah. Okay. Just want to put it in perspective. Okay, so uh, Joe, I'm gonna go to you really quick because yeah, you also have some of these same nuances around your community and large scale projects happening. Absolutely, and you know, and sisters, if you build it, they will come, right? So we have uh, a, a good problem, so we're just trying to manage through that. Um, and with that, we, we've tried to develop more kind of mixed use housing. We have a, an 80 unit apartment complex coming online soon. Uh, we've got two more housing developments that have a little bit more density than some of our traditional um, single family um, zoning does have. So um, in terms of uh, you know filling, filling that need, we're doing the best we can with that. And uh, in addition to that, seeking some of those efficiency measures uh, that Eric was talking about, right? If you're gonna do any kind of urban you know, expansion, those need to be evaluated and implemented. Um, so we're looking uh, towards that, and that, you know, not everybody likes that either, um, but that's a, kind of a necessary step, not only for the betterment of the community, uh, but also uh, for you know, state, state law and state statute for their planning goals. Um, in terms of infrastructure, we've got a great mindful staff in place. Um, ever since 2001, when Sisters got their sewer system in, the population doubled, I believe, within six years. Um, so the staff at the time uh, was mindful of that and built some thoughtful infrastructure in place um, to prepare for that. And, and we're still continuing to do that. We've got two master plans, uh, water and wastewater, that will be coming online here um, in just a couple months. And in terms of transportation, um, obviously Sisters is kind of known as a bottleneck, right? So um, there should be a roundabout uh, locust kind of on the, on the east side of town. Um, hopefully this time next year it will be done which would be a great benefit, and then some other um, kind of what we call them alternate route improvements uh, that will be implemented um, a little bit after that. Um, so that should, that should help out in terms of transportation. Um, but you know, the, the growth is something that, uh, that is uh, definitely difficult for us, and, and managing that with the workforce um, has, been, has been something that's at top of mind for our council. Um, we've also uh, partnered with the Schutz County, thank you to them. They've um, given $500,000 $500, of ARPA funds for an affordable housing project in town. That's gonna be a big benefit to our workforce as well. Excellent. So shall we go, Christy, do you wanna hit housing? Should we start there? Should we talk a wee bit about what's happening in Madras? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Housing in Madras is very interesting. I had our community development director give me some stats because I don't know them. Uh, Again, but one month anniversary today. <laughs> <Yes>. Exactly. <laughs> I'm learning quickly, though. Uh, prior to the pandemic, the prim uh, we primarily developed single family housing, uh, and we did have subsidized housing. After the pandemic, what we've seen is a growth in um, multifamily development. And we have currently under construction a 120 unit, unit market rate development right now. Uh, we also are gonna be doing a ribbon cutting uh, with the Catholic Church on an affordable housing uh, project in our community, 24 units uh, next week, in the next few weeks. So we're really excited to bring that to Madras as well. But one of the great things that our community development department and council have done is they've developed uh, a housing urban renewal area. And so that spurred some development in our community. And we've also done SDC reductions and other things to promote development. And the code changes that we have, uh, if you have a 50 unit subdivision or smaller, you don't even have to go to the planning commission. That's a staff approved development and we can be out the door in about 45 days on some of those. So uh, that's and a- We should pause there for Ben. Did you, I just- Our <laughs> I have a pen and I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, Christy. <laughs> just so wanna, slow down on your note. way through Madras and check us out. <laughs> Please. 
but housing is, housing is um, it, it is very unique. And, and as an interim city manager, I travel across the state and I've never seen a development code like ours. I, I was talking to the community development director and I'm like, what do you mean we take a, a home occupation to the planning commission, but we don't, we don't take a, we don't take a subdivision, you know, up to 50 lots to the planning commission. So it's all staff approved and we have a process in place to really get you through that process quickly. Uh, let's see, some of the other things that we've done is middle housing code changes and the, uh, the other thing is just around our airport. We have a brand new airport and uh, so we've, uh, we have a, not a brand new airport, an airport manager and our manager just started a week after I did and so we are learning so much about our airport and the potential future for Madras and what it can mean for the, the property surrounding it. Um, and that's our industrial area and we, we are focusing on, on that area of town. Uh, for future industrial growth in the city. Love it, thank you. And I, I know you're in the hot seat. You're doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> it's very knowledgeable. Um, okay, so anyone else? Housing that you want to you want to hit? Projects that are coming up or things well, that you want to know? I think yeah, maybe, maybe a theme for all of us is our um, housing mix. We, we are going to either complete or it's in the pipe, it's permitted in the pipeline, about 3,600 units, housing units over the next two years. Um, and 65% of that is multifamily. So we're seeing much more of a shift, and I think that's probably common. I'm seeing some head nods that we're seeing a lot more because of the need for more of a palette of affordability across the region, of smaller units, cottage units, detached townhomes, um, ADUs, all housing types. There's, uh, we're just trying to get much more creative and flexible with our codes and simplify the process. I will say our turnaround times for a single family home are about 50 days. So. <laughs> Yay, ours are, ours are 27 and minutes. <laughs> so, so. I'll just keep going. So we've got, um, in terms of our <laughs> housing quality development, is, just, you know. is uh, I, I don't know, I, I just make numbers up, Eric. Um, we're probably doing Two 250 single family, probably around the same multifamily. And we'll, you know, and a lot of times we're kind of um, following Ben's lead as they continue to create pretty innovative programs, whether it's around housing or homelessness or anything. Um, but where we've, where our council is trying to get their arms around this is um, a lot of the land in Redmond is privately owned in terms of uh, production builders. And uh, we were able to work with the county a few years ago and get 40 acres that now we control. And by doing so, we can control the housing development, the product, all those kinds of things. So we've got a project that's going to yield probably around 450 units called North Point. It's in the very beginning stages of a development agreement where it's going to give us the ability to build housing that is affordable to people with family wage jobs, workforce housing, et cetera. And not just meaning that, you know, the cost per square foot stays the same, but the square footage of the house goes down. So we've got opportunities there. We just bought eight acres uh, from the county, a former cinder pit, and we're going to get to work with innovative partners like Core Community Land Trust and others to continue to find ways to build housing in a way that you can have it be ownership and it can essentially you can use deed restrictions to keep it affordable in perpetuity you know and I won't get into the details of shared appreciation mortgages and things like that but that's what it's going to take for Redmond at least to be able to figure out a way to make our community affordable to people in a more innovative way than just you know smaller houses excellent did you Oh, I can. Yeah. Go right ahead. You look, you look ready. I saw the page uh, turn. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Prineville's very much in line with, with Redmond and, and Ben, too, in a lot of ways regarding trying to come up with a plan to provide those different types of housing for particularly the low income. So, again, uh, we tried to see this coming, and I can just kind of briefly explain what, what we did. So back in 2015, we did a Pacific Crest affordable housing. That was 26 units. Uh, one of the, uh, what I would call a kind of a red letter one was uh, we converted the old Ochoco Elementary School into uh, affordable housing. Of course, we're working with nonprofits to and on those projects. Uh, we just completed in 2019 a 44 unit uh, in Barnes Butte called Barnes Butte Vista. 
and then we just recently in 2020 did a 50 space RV park that's uh, uh, part of that low income process. And then beyond that, uh, very much like what we heard from Eric and, and Keith in that uh, we were very focused on family, uh, single family homes. And uh, we've been in the 2017, for example, 69 homes were built, uh, 2022, 102. But what's really remarkable is if you look at the uh, completed market rate type, uh, high density apartment type uh, facilities or townhomes, over 700 uh, are either, well, let me just say we've got about 200 that are complete and another six, over 600 that are in process uh, and approved through the city. So that's going to change the landscape in Primeville and offer a lot more opportunities than we've had in the past um, besides just residential. So um, we're pleased with that and again I think for all of us is trying to look over the horizon and try and anticipate some of those challenges we have with uh, affordable homes. And I think what you're hearing, there's a synergy among our region partners, and I, um, we're going to highlight that at the end, but I think that um, learning from one another and um, kidding one another also is important. But So to a not so um, sort of funny topic, one in which we are all experiencing in terms of um, whether individuals that we know or um, work that we do or just the impact on our community, and that happens to be the homelessness challenge that we are experiencing. And so... Um, Especially in the larger cities, that's something that um, you know we sort of have watched, and now I, I think we can say it's safely you know in our backyard. Uh, the point in time count numbers are being announced as we sit here right now, and so I just want to give you a little glimpse into what our numbers are. Um, and these are underrepresented, and uh, because it's a one-time snapshot in one day of a person's life. And so uh, this year we have 1,647 unhoused adults and children in our region. 1,189 of those are living in vehicles or outside, considered to be unsheltered. Uh, and uh, that is a 28% increase between last year and this year. 196 of those are children under the age of 18, uh, which makes my, um, just my, gives me the chills. And 133 youth age 18 to 24, and for those that have served our country, we have 71 veterans who are unhoused. So if this is acceptable for anyone, um, I would love to chat with you after. Um, but I would let you know that addressing this issue is not easy, or it would have happened. And if it were up to these six individuals seated right here, they would have waved that magic wand that leads all their councils to great things, and they would have figured it out. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And I think we can all recognize that this issue is one that is not done alone as a city. It takes incredible investment and dedication by the county. It takes state investment, federal investment as well. So that's my preamble to the we won't solve it today. Um, but I do want to note that there is a newish coordinated office and um, uh, joint effort among partners, and that's to help align local government. And so I want to ask, first I'm going to start with Keith, in terms of your thoughts on that effort and what you hope that will um, bring to a city like Redmond. And then for other colleagues, it would be more the unassociated or maybe unanticipated impacts that you would like folks to know that uh, maybe addressing this or not addressing this is um, creating for you as uh, local government and trying to serve. And so that's your tee up, and Keith, I'm going to turn it to you. I mean, the short answer is, and, and your uh, organization is overseeing the deployment of the $14 million in state money, give or take, right? So, um, right, the short answer is we hope it brings money to Redmond, but um, what... Right. What we struggle with um, is it is it is a problem, right? If you were trying to put up a dam in the middle of the ocean, it would be difficult, right? And um, a lot of times, and, and I won't go through the whole 101 of this, right? But there's mental health issues, there's economic issues, there's house, there's so many issues that are associated with this, and trying to figure out where in the continuum you're trying to solve for it. Right now, what what we're looking at. Um, and, and my council's looking at, and they've already invested a million dollars in, in state money. They made that decision uh, a couple months ago, is to figure out how we can help the folks that are, you know, in their RVs and on the streets and or out in, you know, the, the sage and the juniper in really poor conditions, find opportunities to at least begin to move through 
of the continuum to get to housing. So for us, uh, we're working with a consortium of individuals on um, kind of shelter projects. You know, it's not quite a, a pallet home, but kind of like a tiny home similar to the Veterans Village. Uh, we've got an incredible partner with Rick Russell at Mountain View Fellowship Church, who is um, taking this safe parking concept that goes on statewide. And the quickest way to describe it is, right, you've got property, you've got a parking lot, you put five RVs for people to li live in them, um, and help them be able to solve problems like maybe they don't have a registration for their car, maybe they need you know help getting job interviews. A lot of these folks um, are uh, they're they're not heavily burdened with drug and alcohol issues. Um, really, none of them are. So you're trying to figure out ways to make a difference, really, in the lives of five or six people at a time. Unless you're Gwen Weisling, who's making a much bigger difference for the folks at Bethlehem Inn, but you're trying to make a difference and help people up and out of the situation. We know that, like, that the 14 million countywide is not um, adequate to solve the problem. You hear Portland, Seattle, who have 250 million to 500 million. I mean, that's what we need in this region to really tackle it. Um, but the good thing is, and I will talk about this at the end is that whether it's homelessness or anything else, like all the city managers work together to try and figure out how to solve problems. And um, this one is particularly difficult. Anyone else associated impacts on your communities? Yeah, I mean, for, and I look around the room and I'm seeing like, Ruth, you've been, you've been helpful at moderating, facilitating conversations with community. Gwen with Bethlehem Inn, Chief Porter, a, a retired police chief, is helping set up the first pallet structure with Central Oregon Villages uh, east of Bend. We have so many, it is a community issue and there's many voices, uh, opinions uh, on this issue and I, I, I think we all, we, we owe it to our community to come together and work on this and lean in. And I think uh, instead of, it's really easy right now to stay in your little corners or have some kind of filter that you look at. There's no filter. There's just, it is really complex. So all options are on the table. And I think for, for us, we, that included buying three facilities in two years. Um, we used our ARPA funds and got some state funding and bought two hotels and bought a uh, congregate shelter, low barrier shelter. And it's that that same process, what we talked about with housing, having a different palette of options, same thing with, you're gonna have to meet people where they're at. So there's gonna be a, a tiny home village, uh, maybe it's a low barrier congregate shelter, transitional housing, the, the sort of hotel kind of con conversion concept, um, all of it is needed. And I think that's what we're finding is, as we grow alongside our region, we have to think more creatively. And this is not something all that new. We've seen that in other parts of our history of where we're just out of whack with demand and supply. And and we've got to think creatively about housing options. But there's another element, and that's the service side. And I think people are being, you know, Oregon does not have a good track record of mental health and addiction services. And it, it, is, it is much more multidisciplinary, much more complex. Um, it's not just one or the other. It's not just a housing, not just a service. It's all of the above. And so it, need, it means we um, need to look at it through all those different dimensions. And cities just have one piece of it. So Anything on the public safety side that maybe... Yeah, and maybe on that point, I think what's happening, though, is our first responders, uh, because we have this you call, we come approach in Central Oregon, that's been kind of our history. I think we all have great uh, relationships with our public safety partners and police and fire, uh, but they're seeing, they're becoming that, that first response uh, for folks experiencing a mental health crisis, um, uh, an addiction issue, they're, they're, they're needing help. And so our calls for service, I was on a ride along with a police officer, uh, just last week, and I said, well, how, how many of your calls are impacted by folks that are experiencing homelessness? She's like, 65% of my call of my calls. Um, fire, 20% in some of our fire stations, are those, those responses are going. So we, we, it's affecting us as a city, so we need to, f to really address some, sort of the, the upstream uh, issues so that we aren't, our public safety, safety systems aren't stretched. So, okay. Can I jump in? Yeah, and I really appreciate what, what Eric said about uh, the service side of things and the impact we have on public safety as our first responders are often tasked with, you know, solving these issues, at least on a, on a temporary or day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, one of the things I know Chief Porter and, and former Chief Dale Cummins over in Prineville, and I'm sure others, um, 
keeping an eye on the root cause and what we can do, as Eric said, to bring these people up and out of their current situations, which is obviously very difficult. And that kind of goes back to relationships and partnerships. And I know we've all struggled uh, here regionally and, and across the country on keeping a full staff with our public safety forces, given the climate that we're in. Uh, and that adds another burden and another layer of difficulty to what we're trying to do to help these folks in need. But having said that, and one of the examples that I know uh, Eric and, and Chief Kranz's team, along with uh, Jim Porter before, we were putting um, health uh, experts in with our, with our officers. And unfortunately in Prineville we had to stop doing that because we were down on staff. We were, we were pretty much healed up now, but um, I think those are the type of innovative things and partnerships that develop out of uh, the city managers and the county administrators working together. And that's, you know, quite frankly where I got the ideas from Eric and Keith and we talked about it over in Prineville and we were able to partner with one of our service industries to do that. But I, I just bring that up is, is on two, two aspects. One is the partnership uh, working together is providing some avenues to try to help the situation and make an impact. And the other side is, is you know, what is those, those best practices that we need to deploy to try to get to the root cause and, and bring these people up out of their situations that are, that are really tough. Well, Steve, I'm glad that you said that you really want to work together with other communities because one of the challenges that we are facing in Madras is a shortage in our police department and in Jefferson County overall. Uh, but our police department is about half staffed right now. Uh, within the last two days, we had two officers go out on medical uh, issues. And uh, so we are, are going to be calling all of you to ask for some assistance uh, in shifts, maybe getting some background so that we can get some laterals hired. We need to get boost our department back up quickly uh, so that we can address the, the issues that our community is facing. Uh, law enforcement is very important and it, it's a part of our organization that is um, most important to me and I want to ensure that our, our staff is supported and that they have the tools they need to be successful in our community at addressing all of those issues that they have to face. And so um, if you can talk with your departments, I would love to hear from you. We have an interim chief right now. Uh, he's retired from Oregon State Police and uh, he is making great strides, but unfortunately we had these two setbacks um, in the last few days and so we're really struggling. Uh, but we will have 14 uh, when we're fully staffed in our department, so. One of the things that you brought up was laterals, and I, I think this is really an interesting fact for all of us to understand, and, and I certainly didn't until I got engaged in public service, but when she says a lateral officer, that's somebody that, say, is in the Portland area and comes to work for Eric, for example, or Chief Krantz, um, and you can kind of put them to work right away. So it's real easy for people to say, well, just hire more police, raise their wages, and, and get, them, get them engaged. And that's true. The problem is, and help me out here, gang, over in public safety, but uh, um, if we hire somebody new um, that hasn't had gone through the DPSST, uh, hasn't had the field training that they need, it's really about an 18th month process. So we could hire three or four new police officers or a Christie could over in Madras and we're really about a year and a half away before they're on their own and doing things like, you know, preventative public safety service and, and that type of thing and, and able to act on their own. So keep that in mind. It's, it's really a complex, difficult problem for our public safety folks right now. And we can't just keep, you know, if we steal laterals from other agencies, then they're short. So it's, it's really a, a matter of um, filling the pipeline up with good, good people that are passionate about public safety that want to go through the process. It's going to take some time. Here, should I be optimistic for the first time this year? <laughs> moment yeah. of silence. Yes. Yeah, actually, the moment passed. I'm all right. The, um, no, so a the, the couple things. One is that people should know that like, one of the biggest places where we work as a region is there is a you know, tri-county team that takes a look at major drug trafficking issues, major regional law enforcement issues, and it's, you know, everybody from the cities up here plus counties, and, and they get together and they've got a special team that kind of works, uh, whatever, in the shadows to try and address some of these issues and to take care of some of the drug busts you see in the paper is because our teams are all working together. We actually deploy 
in Redmond uh, officer each year that has a three-year assignment of, of working with this team. So there's a lot of coordination and no one city, while you might be short-staffed, it's kind of a different issue, um, just having to deal with some of these larger public safety issues on their own. And then the other piece, what Steve is talking about, with, you know, in terms of the training and certification, is again, with Tammy's group, uh, working with probably a bunch of people in this room, uh, we're looking at building a you know, multi-hundred acre regional training facility that would be just north of, of the Redmond Airport that would serve training needs, serve you know, uh, for, for police, for fire, and become that center that um, you know, will live on well after the Cascadia earthquake hits. So, well, eventually. Um, the, uh, so we're working on this $150 million project. They've already got nine or 10 million uh, in state dollars for it. We're gonna have to get a lot of federal money. But what you've got is, you're hearing up here all these kind of emergency near-term issues, but at the same time, there's a lot of long-term thinking of how do we bring resources and amenities to this region that we're gonna need in the long term. And so there's a lot of stuff that, that's going on that's positive as well. And just to tag on to your positivity, uh, uh, we should all be proud uh, of, of one, it's hard to be proud sometimes, at least my perspective of what's going on in the state. But uh, one of the things I would say is this uh, DPSST training that's required for all our public safety officers, whether it's county, uh, city, whether it's um, uh, related to the prison system, all, all our public safety folks have to go through that. And if I'm saying something wrong, Jim or uh, Chief Grants, please jump up there and correct me. But um, not every state has that. And I think, you know, with the situation that we find ourselves in as a country, um, you know, just hiring somebody off the streets and putting, putting that responsibility on them, you know, has, has some risks. And one thing about Oregon is, is we do uh, invest in training these folks um, to serve the public from a safety perspective. And I, and I think it's really important that we continue to do that because our officers that come out of DPSST are a step ahead of many other parts of the country that don't have that service and that requirement. So it's, it's really important we should be proud of, of the training that we invest in for these public safety folks that put their life on the line. And, and I know why Keith is so happy over there. Yeah. He's got the highest tax rate of all of us. <laughs> um, if, if Bend had uh, Redmond's tax rate, we'd have about $12 million more in revenue a year. I don't know if folks know how the, the inequities of the property tax system, which takes me back to public safety, um, if we had 12 more million, we wouldn't need to go out for a fire levy or we've, we've got issues within our police and fire because we have a low, our tax rate hasn't changed since 1981. And Bend in, in the 90s, voters just capped everybody's tax rate. So we're constrained to be able to provide services. So we have to rely on things like operating levies, going to the voters every five years to, and we have one right, right now with our fire and EMS system. So go, let's go there because I believe two of you do. So let's talk about levies in, in terms of your fire services. I'll let Jeff go so first. So Jeff, do you want to... You have a uh, levy on the ballot, yes? Well, um, the city the, of Lapine does not, not. Right, but, but your community the, the, for the your special district, the fire services district does. Yes. And it doesn't require a deep analysis. Essentially, the, you know, the, the limits of the district have not changed. Um, they've remained the same over a long period of time, but the population in that region has grown exponentially. As I mentioned earlier, 14,000 people in, in what we consider Greater Lapine. Um, so they, they just can't respond in the way that they once did. Um, that is certainly hampered by the fact that we're such a long distance in Deschutes County standards from the main medical center here in Bend, at St. Charles. Um, while we do have essentially an urgent care at this point, it is, it is not capable of serving the responses that that district does. So when, what I'm getting at is when an ambulance responds, it's then taken out of the equation for about two and a half to three hours. And there's two ambulances essentially once you get outside of Sun River and all of South County. Um, so that's the reality. And I'm, I'm hoping that the voters in the greater district do support that. Um, there have been challenges for that district, not, not self-created, just a, an example of, of the times that we're in and the constriction that they have to face. And they're operating right now, last time I spoke with them, um, they're operating with about 12 firefighters and paramedics uh, short of what they're normally operating at. At any given time, there's only two people on duty for the whole district right now, so. 
And that mutual aid is something that definitely gets uh, relied upon, but without having those basic services and that sustainability to make sure that you can count on what's there um, is critical. So thank you for that um, overview. Eric, anything that you'd like to add? Because I know that you have yeah, a levy on the ballot as well. We, we've been under an operating levy since 2014. We haven't changed the rate in 10 years. Uh, we are needing to increase it to pay for 10 staff that we, we just had to hire last year with one-time ARPA funds because we needed them. Our response times were slipping. Um, so we've hired them, we need to sustain them. We also have growth coming and a 60% increase in call load in the last 10 years. Um, so it's, it, that increase is needed to add that staff to keep up with growth and ultimately keep those response times low, which saves lives. So um, that's on the ballot this May. So I'd also just put in a plug that, you know, we have many seasons, although I think we only have one right now, which is just winter and then a little lighter winter and then winter again and lighter winter. Uh, but we also have a fire season. And unfortunately, I, I grew up in this community. We never talked about the season of fire, but we have one and that's a reality. And so these investments in public safety are critical to being able to respond. So we are just about at, uh, we have about five minutes left. I wanted to talk a little bit about the regional aspect of the work that you get to do. I think you're hearing it. Um, a drought doesn't stop in one particular jurisdiction. We don't have a wildfire that stops. Uh, uh, whether, no matter what the issue, very few of them stop within your city limits. And so, um, Steve, may I just a you know couple couple sentences on uh, the value of working together? And um, I would say that for many that um, work in this arena, this is not usually how it looks. It isn't usually your city managers coming together, talking about how they are learning from each other, talking about how they're they're actually leveraging each other's ideas. But anything that you might want folks to know about that? Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, we, we maybe are a little bit unique in that we collaborate very closely together. I, I also think that um, you mentioned, you know, natural resources or water is a hot topic right now, um, and rightfully so. Um, that's a great example of what we do together um, with a lot of other interested parties besides just the cities and the municipalities. And that is how we manage water. So there's several efforts that combined with all of us is, you know, the DBBC, Deschutes Basin Board of Control, um, the farming community, all the irrigation districts, uh, the city of Prineville. Um, and the reason for that is very obvious. You know, the Crooked River flows into Deschutes, the Metolius throws in, flows into the Deschutes, and, and we're all in this game together to try to manage uh, a balance between municipal use, agricultural use, recreation, and of course, you know, importantly, our natural environment. And what's really interesting is, is the work that we've been doing now for many, many years, well over, well, gosh, I, I think probably a couple decades now, and it got pretty intense the last 10 or 12 years, is we're working together on, you know, how do we serve, you know, municipal needs? How do we keep our farming community healthy? and how we address things like the spotted frog and the reintroduction of the salmon into the tributaries around the Deschutes Basin. And we've been successful in that effort on a lot of fronts, working with the Deschutes River Conservancy, uh, who are here today. Uh, we're all in this together. And, and a great example, and of course it's my job to highlight Prineville, and I'm very proud to do that. But an example of that would be um, working with the Deschutes River Conservancy. There's an effort that's moving forward. We call it the Mackay Switch, and the Mackay Creek's a tributary of the Crooked River. And it's also been designated as a, a very important spawning ground in the past. And now that the Crooked River does have salmon in it that uh, migrate back and forth between the ocean and, and our tributaries, this uh, effort will provide the farmers on Mackay Creek pressurized water, stored water out of Bowman Dam or Primeville Reservoir and, and keep that flow very natural. All the dams will be removed and the farmers' pumps will be removed off that little creek. And that's possible because of us all working together. Every city, every county, a lot of uh, nonprofits. Uh, we've got the funding to, to start that project. It will come full circle. There's no question about that. But if we didn't all work together, those type of projects, and there's many others on the Deschutes, uh, the success that's been over in the Sisters area with uh, rehabilitating their, their tributaries um, into the Metolius is, is uh, award winning. And I think um, that's really the power of all, all of us working together to use that for an example. Prineville got ahead a little bit, in my opinion, as a result of the data centers and our ability to leverage them with the aquifer storage and recharge. And, and really what that's about is we were able to get stored water out of Bowman Dam dedicated to the city 
recognizing we couldn't keep putting straws in the ground, especially in the Prineville area, and we're now filling an aquifer during the winter months with water from the Crooked River, and we have a gaining aquifer. There's a huge natural aquifer under the Prineville Airport, and so we've got one of the only aquifers in the West that is gaining, and then we can use that water, we can pump that water out, lots of it, uh, during the hottest days of the year. And if you look at a municipal water system, it, it, you know, we kind of look at that four times uh, the winter rate versus the summer rate, summer rate being four times as much. And if we can find a way uh, in our area to preserve that water and not put so much stress on the flows of our tributaries and find innovative ways to um, do that without harming natural resources, fish, frogs, uh, mollusks, all those things that uh, we're concerned about. Uh, it's a very innovative way to do the environmental right thing to do, like, you know, stewardship is what it is. And um, Keith's uh, group has been working with Prineville on the wetlands uh, project, which um, treats wastewater and puts nice, cold, naturally clean water back into the Crooked River. Um, Redmond's working on that. Uh, I think Sisters might be as well. Yep. Um, so these are all innovative stewardship, environmental stewardship projects that would not happen without the collaboration of this team. And we should all be proud of that because we're making well, and, a difference. And Steve, I think we need to thank you. You've been really representing us well on those I efforts for that. so many years. Like, seriously, I think we rely on each other's strengths, yeah. and yeah. that is your strength. So thank you. One, one, of, one of the things that Keith reminds me of is I'm redneckered than he is. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we are really getting known as. Um, and not just, just regionally, but nationally, uh, as environmental stewards. And, and that, we, again, another thing for us to be proud about. It's, it's really true that Central Oregon is ahead of, of many of our contemporaries throughout our country in addressing some of these issues proactively and getting some results. So, Excellent. thanks everybody. Thank yeah. you. So I have one last, oh, Joe, did you want to comment? Go oh, ahead, I, I can pipe up a little bit. You know, the City of Sisters is a little unique. Our, our aquifer, you know, not as powerful as maybe Prineville's, but it, but it does, it has not receded it. It fluctuates, rather. Um, and, and so we're mindful of that regardless. And uh, our city just, uh, in our use, has seen 18% a decrease in water usage due to some, several measures, uh, that's just year over year last year. And uh, also that's, you know, a testament to um, kind of the, the priorities, I think, that we're taking to the region and, um, you know, and kind of the initiative of staff to reduce that, that consumption but still keeping the kind of the, the, the pleasant appearance of our, of our area. Yeah. So thank you for that. That's great. And I love how you're leveraging um, each other, too. So the last question that I have is, uh, Christy, do you really have a robot wandering the sidewalks in Madras? <laughs> We do, but he has a little antenna issue um, over the last few days. But yes, uh, have you seen the, uh, the food delivery robots? Um, we're doing a pilot study in Madras with a, um, an entrepreneurial company that is uh, doing a test for us. And they are able to take photos of the sidewalk and do a sidewalk analysis to determine whether we have any heaving in our sidewalks, if there's any repairs that need to be done. So that robot is actually going to be saving us an enormous amount of staff time. Uh, and if it's successful, we'll consider using it on our trail system as well, which is pretty comprehensive. And um, so there's that. And I do have to share this one great story before I leave because it's notable. Uh, Fire Chief, uh, Fire and EMS Chief Jeff Blake uh, recently joined our community a year ago. And he's been partnering with our public works staff. And we have, um, you know, issue with tall weeds and grass growing into some of the areas of Madras. And so we contracted with a company to bring in a herd of goats. And they chewed down all of this shrubs and all these things and just really <laughs> made a significant difference. And that's what I really love about working for a small community. Uh, you you um, have to be thoughtful in how you spend your money and, and what's really going to get the job done. And if you think about how many man hours that would take to, to get people in there doing all of that work, it really saved a significant amount of time. It's putting us in good shape in advance of the fire season to kind of prevent that if there's some issues. And um, it's one that it's a, another fun story to tell about Madras. Love it. Hey, hey Christy. Um, I, it just occurred to me that I haven't seen the robot and Keith 
at the same time, do you think? <laughs> I, seems like there's a correlation. <laughs> it's a real head scratcher, isn't it? So with that, <laughs> let's go to questions. There's a payback coming, I have a feeling. So. Go ahead. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, and we will get the microphone over to you. Right, of course. Uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Steve, I'm aware of a project that you guys are working on in Prineville, uh, the biomass project. Um, I wanted to get a feel from the other city managers uh, where their communities and leadership from their councils are in support of that project. But I can, we, Keith and I wrap, Keith. <laughs> see, see what you did? Uh, Steve and I have been talking about that. Um, actually, he's meeting, we're, we have an environment and climate committee here in Bend, um, and we have goals around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we are looking at a potential partnership with uh, relying on some ener uh, renewable energy. So I think we're in the early stages of exploring that, but um, yeah, Keith, or, uh, Keith, what are you doing? <laughs> I, have, I have no comment right now. He's in a robot. <laughs> Well, I'll, 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 I'd love to have an opportunity, so I'll, I'll make it quickly. Um, the biomass project is, uh, biomass has been around a long time, um, and I have a gentleman <clears throat> right across the way from me here that uh, knows a lot about this as well, Mr. Shelk. Um, one of the things that we're leveraging is our relationship with the large amount of power that's being consumed in our community. But if ever there was a time for biomass, um, the technology has come to a point where 99.9% .9 of the PM 2.5 or the particulates that would emit has been, uh, the technology has really gotten very well at a very clean operation. Um, but having said that, it's really about the environment. And we have to treat the forest, at least, again, in my opinion, and replicate what Mother Nature did years ago. There's 10 times more junipers in our area than there was pre-settlement. And the impact that they have on the watershed is significant in a big way. If you look at our rainfall, now I know we've been in a drought, but if you look at our rainfall over the last hundred years in terms of precipitation, total precipitation, all precipitation, it really hasn't changed a whole lot. But if you look at the stream flows, they've gone down dramatically and they're continuing to go down. And so we think there's a correlation between and an opportunity to remove some junipers and uh, preserve the natural look of the land and increase the water content in the soils and therefore in the tributary springs and such. And beyond that, there's other environmental attributes in terms of air quality. I know in talking with uh, Eric's um, staff, um, you know, we, we see a loss in tourism when we have these big smoke events. And there is a correlation between the wildfire and the smoke events, as we know. And we think that a treated forest is much more fire resistant than a non-treated forest. Um, we don't want to go out and cut old growth, we understand that. But there's an opportunity to, to monetize that to some minimal degree and produce some power. And where it gets real interesting, if you think about it, we do have battery technology coming on. We've got the most uh, solar farm acreage in the state here in Central Oregon. And, you know, this is baseload power, which is important and always will be important for, for serving our, our citizens. And so maybe we could use that to combat uh, uh, climate change in terms of what Eric's mandates are through the city of Bend. Uh, maybe we could charge batteries during uh, the day to build a bridge between solar power when the sun's not shining. There's a whole host of opportunities. And the really bottom line is, is we don't have any capacity inbound into the Central Oregon bubble from BPA or Pacific Core or PGE. Those lines are full. And the time it takes to build a new line, which I believe one will be built or two will be built, is about 10 or 15 years. So what do we do right now for industry, for more technology and those type of things? So we think it's a good time to work on this. And I've been working with uh, people like John Shelk, and we've, we've done a lot of presentation to educate people on why this makes sense. From an environmental standpoint, um, urban wood waste is a big problem for our landfills. And as we all know, landfills are getting really difficult to re repurpose or, or uh, uh, redesignate or find new places. And if we could remove that urban wood waste, that would be a, another thing from the environment 
that would be helpful. So that's what we're up to over in Prineville, and we've got a lot of support from all the communities and the counties and uh, our governor and, and our uh, federal legislators and lawmakers have all been supportive at this point. So hopefully that'll be another attribute that Central Oregon has in the future. All right, we have another question over here. Good afternoon, how are you guys doing? Thank you for all the work you're doing, appreciate it. Uh, first, I'm still trying to get over that rednecker comment, but we'll go over there. <laughs> um, we're in a professional setting, really? Okay, um, first question is this. You talked about uh, level wages or family wages. Those are mostly geared toward working for white men. How are we gonna make that parity to make sure that women and people of color are getting the same wages? Secondly, how are we gonna attract businesses to come in Oregon? Because historically, Oregon's not known for bringing different companies here to be able to provide jobs and opportunities for people. And then finally, when are we gonna get together as a unit to create a better transportation system that is basically Central Oregon based because it's really, really hard for people to get around? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll start. Uh, uh, I'll start with the, with the point about diversity, and you know, again, you know, I, I made a joke about Primeville being a redneck, and some of my contemporaries in Primeville would would uh, appreciate that name as well. But one of the things that, again, going back to collaboration, um, I'm a member of the board of, at the DRC, and before George Floyd, we, uh, as a result of DRC's vision we were introduced and were trained on JEDI, um, which is the same thing as you know, DEI, whatever you want to call it. And I took it upon myself to introduce that to my council and my leadership staff in Prineville, Oregon. And my goal was to make people aware of things just like I wasn't aware of some of the systematic negative aspects of things we didn't even know we were doing that made an impact. And describe, you know, as you described, sir. And so we tried to get ahead of that. And uh, it was real interesting when we had uh, opportunities to meet with groups from Central Oregon that are championing that, in that uh, they were surprised that we had at least been introduced to that subject. The other thing I would say with respect to Prineville is having the data centers there. And as we all know, they, they work really hard on that. That's a, a mandate from their stakeholders and stockholders. So if, if you were to go up to Facebook or Apple, you'll see a very diverse group of folks up there um, covering uh, all, all, all types of people and uh, from every aspect that we're dealing with today. And that's a big shift for Primeville, big shift. And I'm very happy that um, almost without exception, it's, it's worked, and those, the, some of those folks that well, maybe weren't, you wouldn't think about being uh, traditionally welcomed in the town of Prineville, we'll see them at the horse races, we'll see them at the parades, we'll see them at the rodeo even, and I think that's uh, a testimony to moving the needle a little bit. I'm not gonna say this is a, a major uh, accomplishment by any stretch, but we're moving the needle, and I think that's important that we try to accelerate that. Uh and I, I would add, I think part of, we are all, we all have bias. We all live in our bubbles. It's getting worse. And I think our job is to pop those bubbles uh, as leaders in our community to open ourselves up, challenge ourselves. It starts with those basic relationships, building those relationships, and nothing more complicated than that. I think one of the things that I'm excited about we're launching this summer is a party trailer. It's a trailer that the city bought. We've staffed it or stuffed it with uh, chairs, grills, things like that, just to go out in the community, have a party, meet people, and really un and actually have some food and develop those relationships. That's what's missing. I think we can kind of talk all day long up here, but it doesn't happen. The good stuff doesn't happen until the relationship is there, and we've got a lot of work to do for sure. I'll hit transit. Um, so uh, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, I believe we might need to dismantle a little bit of what we currently have and rebuild so that it actually meets the needs of today versus yesterday. So 
that's my little uh, part. So we, as your transit provider for the region, um, we are working diligently to get smaller vehicles, more drivers, diverse drivers, people who are trained to be able to serve the community, um, no matter how they're showing up, and being able to um, increase the uh, services that we provide in the outlying areas coming into the Bend area. Our largest ridership is actually our community connectors. And so, um, but for those that are in the Bend community, I would just submit to you that the system that we have right now is not meeting our needs, and it is incumbent upon us as your partner in working with all of you and making sure that we look at that differently. So um, we are, uh, if you have a CDL, please see me after. Uh, and uh, we are doing our very best to uh, be a choice place where people want to work. And in terms of us as an organization, we have looked at all of our um, hiring practices, how we are possibly excluding people, even in just what we're asking for them. Do you need to have a bachelor's degree to drive a bus? No, is it a career? Yes. And so um, we're working on showing up a little bit differently too. So um, transit is critical, and thank you for raising it. But not my show. Anyone else want to um, respond to Marcus's question? I can't. You must have gotten a text from our communications director because I hadn't mentioned it yet. The, uh, no, thanks for the question. So one of the other big projects going on in Redmond is basically doubling the size of our commercial air terminal. And the first phase of that will be a $145 million project. And um, we're in the middle, kind of towards the end of the design right now. And so what it will mean, aside from having, you know, essentially uh, probably 80% more gates. Uh, from the, you'll be seeing things like, uh, you know, a second story and whatever those skyways are called. And what it means, though, economically is, right, we're getting, we've surpassed the pre-COVID levels at the airport. So we're getting more than a million people coming and going now through uh, the airport that we run that serves Central Oregon. Uh, we're getting more destinations. Uh, there's going to be an announcement next week of a new destination. Um, by an airline that's been with us for a few years and extremely Marcus, successful. Tell, tell us, tell us right now, tell us. <laughs> Can we get to Portland finally? Is it Portland? Is it Portland? <clears throat> so, the, the, uh, I'm going to... Wachowski Airlines, is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, Wachowski Airlines. I'm, I'm trying to be serious. You know how hard it is for me. So, in terms of the, yeah, the economic impact, um, the airport is huge. And um, from an economic impact, from parking, I was talking to Joe, you know, from Sisters uh, before this, we received more than $5 million a year in parking revenue alone. And that was at the $15 rate. Now it's $24. Very easy, just a dollar an hour for if you're going to stay there over a, a full day period. And it's going to generate more than $9 million. And that money is going to help facilitate the growth of the airport terminal and the further investments in the airport. So. It is like literally the economic engine. Um, we're seeing enormous growth. Uh, we're seeing flights come back um, that uh, had kind of gone away pre-COVID. Chicago is probably any coming back. We're going after some direct flights to Dallas. And in terms of the, the Portland issue, it was more that during COVID, um, airlines cut back on flights and um, pilots said, wait, why am I, you know, burning the candle at both ends. I want to fly a little bit less. So it was a pilot shortage piece, and it's also um, an air, uh, airplane piece, right? So we are not LA or San Francisco or Chicago, so if they need airplanes, they move those to other routes. So we got the short end of the stick on certain routes, but what we're seeing also now is um, larger airplanes, 737s coming in. So instead of those planes that seat about 85, these other planes seat you know, more than 170. Uh, we fully expect Portland to come back uh, this October, um, probably not to the level it had before, but um, the last piece, because I feel like I can like, actually do some teaching. The, uh, the way our flights work is that, you know, the airlines pick destinations from Redmond that go to cities that have 
a bunch of other destinations, so, right? So you'd go to a San Francisco, because from there you can go to about a million other places. What we found in the data is the people that flew to Portland, only like 25% stayed there. So what they did is they're like, let's move more flights to Seattle because there's more destinations. And that's kind of how Portland also got removed from the, the constellation of destinations. But yeah, it's coming back. More flights are coming back. And it's just a gem of an airport. We all know that. You can get in and out pretty easily. And um, thank you for the question. Um, Bess Goggins, Boys and Girls Clubs of Bend. I'm hearing a lot from the communities in the region about the progress and momentum and reflection that's happening for growth. Um, and as there are investments being made in lots of different pockets of what's needed, I'm thinking about childcare. And when I'm thinking about childcare, I want to be very clear that my definition is infants to five-year-olds and school-aged kids because our three-year-olds become six and eight-year-olds so quickly. And as families are moving into all of our communities and we're thinking about how to house them, that's our workforce. And when they go to work, their kids need a safe place to go. So what are the different communities thinking about in regards to childcare with the growing need of seats, both for our younger kids and for our older school-aged kids? Thank you. I'll jump on this one quickly um, because we're, we're the smallest or least populated community here, and so we have the fewest resources, and therefore the, the, the problem doesn't have outlets that are essentially controlled for by other elements right now. It's very apparent in our community how it affects us. We have created economic incentives to attract any number of businesses or organizations, but fortunately for us, those incentives that we put out there did attract a local nonprofit that is going to bring the first formal child care that is run through a nonprofit, not through a private agency or through you know private individual into the community. Now that's only going to start out with about 10 seats, but they're hoping that if it is successful that by year three we're looking at maybe 30 to 40 seats because they bought the lot next door as well, again under those incentives to expand that. And that's part of the three-legged stool and the problem that we have in Lapine in that what comes first, the jobs, the housing, or child care? Well, they're all interdependent on one another. And the fact that we, we've attracted this group with those incentives it's essentially answers one of those questions, and we're hoping that begets the other two. But it is a, a first formal motion forward um, that in the 16 years we're going to have this organization uh, that was not there pre previous at any point in that 16-year period of time, and we're very, very excited about it. And we've publicized it in the community and gotten a great response. <coughs> I can't really speak for Madras, but I used to work for the city of Silverton as their city manager, and one of the things that we did there is that the city owned some homes that were adjacent to uh, our main park in the, in the community. And we leased that to a nonprofit organization, and one of the homes also housed uh, a daycare. And so that was one of the things that we did in that community to address child care. You know, I think for, for us, we've exempted system development charges for child care, so that's a huge reduction in establishing new child care as just a policy matter. Um, and then we've also provided some ARPA dollars when we, we had some one-time funds, and we it, it's kind of like the issue around homelessness. It's not a city core service, but we want to be a good partner and do what we can within our role. Um, so I know OSU, Cascades, the Chamber, there's many folks, East Cascades, they've, they've been working on this issue and coming up with really creative programs. There's a, part, a program starting at OSU Cascades to train more folks, just to increase the supply of childcare providers. So it, it's multifaceted. Another fun thing I will say is that you as employers can also take a role in providing daycare. I work for a consultant firm out of Southern Oregon, and one of the things that we have in uh, the office space is we just moved to a new building, and in the basement, we have completely remodeled that space and turned it into uh, a place where our employees can bring their children to work, and we have a daycare provider um, in-house, and that is a way to attract and retain the employees that we have uh, for our organization there. Okay, we have a question back here. On the note of housing, um, as we are adding more housing, I <clears throat> challenge you all to think about the affordable aspect, not just in building the structure, but in reducing energy burden. So having lived here for 33 years, 
been in the development and building industry, it's not just important to put a house up, it's important to think about what are the long-term costs of that house going to be. And if we're not building efficiently, if we're not insulating those homes, if we're not providing adequate ventilation and healthy homes building, we really are not doing people any favors. We need to make affordable housing that reduces energy burden, that reduces water consumption, <laughs> and <laughs> on that note, just a shout out and comment that we also need to be thinking about dark skies. I'm sure I'm not the only person in here who's lived in Central Oregon for three decades. One of the things that drew me here were the beautiful starry night skies, having come from big cities. And I don't want to lose that, and I'm losing it. And so shout out again to Steve for the dark skies policy in Prineville. Let's make that happen not only in new developments, but in existing developments. That is one of the beautiful attractors to our region. So thank you. Any comments on green building or dark skies? Okay. I would say dark skies is important to our sisters community as well. In fact, our city council um, approved their council goals uh, just in last February, and, and dark skies was a component of that. And although we do have a code in place, I think to her point, it's it, it is about uh, evaluating you know the compliance, the enforcement. What about the the, you know, the the existing homes and and how everyone is affected by that? So it's definitely top of mind for for us, and I'm sure everybody else as well. And, and for Benfra on the energy side, so energy in buildings is a key tenant of our climate action plan. Uh, council recently approved a home energy score to raise awareness on uh, when a, a home is, when there's a transaction with a home so that people know what they're getting into and what their energy costs are long term. Not just those upfront costs, but those long term costs and making improvements, incentivizing folks to make improvements to their home for efficiency. All right, last question. Yeah, I'm Jim Lucier, and I uh, started at St. Charles in 1970, and this is a great uh, conversation. I think the thing that hits me is that you are all representatives of communities, but they're kind of like departments in a hospital. You have to get it done together. And we, d we don't have a vision for this region about where we're going. I think that's a great opportunity for the City Club to look at that and get the, get the other people involved that are, cult, that are people that are paying taxes because that's where we're going. I don't think our, our growth rate's going to go away, right? We need to get it planned and the hopefully the public needs to understand that that's going to cost us investments if we want to maintain what we have here or it's going to go away. So my hope is that you tell us how City Club can get that kind of conversation going. Any comments on regional strategic planning? <laughs> so as your region's council yeah. of governments, yeah. uh, <laughs> that that we are working on that right now. We have a survey out. And so, um, Kim, I'll meet with you offline. I think it probably does make sense for us to um, share what the Regions Council of Governments is doing, which really is the string that tries to tie all of these things together alongside our counties uh, and the state and federal government, too. So thank you, Jim. And uh, absolutely, yes, we, that strategy is um, being refreshed as we speak. All right, so I'll go ahead and transition to right here. <laughs> um, so thank you to Tammy and our city managers for leading us in conversation today. So many of the topics that came up today um, turn into or have been City Club forums. That's it's a very natural progression, including next month on Thursday, May 18th. Uh, our next forum is going to be, um, we'll be at, back at the River House, but it's Bending the Curve, Pathways Out of Houselessness. Uh, we also have five remaining virtual candidate forums for um, offices in Deschutes County. And you can find information on our website, um, cityclubco.org, about when those are happening. Um, I'm also excited that we have launched our spring membership drive um, as a nonprofit. 
We only exist with the support of our members. And our members are really who got City Club through the past couple years and then the pandemic. So rebuilding that base of support is how we're gonna continue to bring these forums and more programming forward. So we have a couple incentives. For current members, um, if you refer a member and they join between, before May 31st, uh, you get a chance, or you're gonna get a, a free uh, pass for an upcoming forum. And then if you join before May 31st, you're gonna get entered to win a case of Va Piano wine. <laughs> And yeah, summer is coming, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, so thank you all for being here today and your continued willingness to engage in conversation on, in uh, on topics important to our community. Thank you.